Well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for um, Special Education 101. I'm um, excited to introduce our fabulous presenter, Dr. Laura Savage. Um, Dr. Savage was the Special Education Ombuds person for San Francisco Unified School District for many years. Um, has done lots of other amazing, amazing things and is now um, running her own DEI consulting firm. And we're just so pleased um, to be partnering with her. And she brings amazing amounts of experience and expertise and knowledge about special education. Um, so welcome, Dr. Savage, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I see some familiar faces, so that's awesome. Hello to you all. Um, as Sue said, I um, do have um, most of my background in education actually has been in special education, even prior to being the uh, ombudsperson for San Francisco Unified. I've had uh, kind of uh, since that uh, a paraeducator, a resource uh, specialist, and you know, um, in teaching um, at multiple levels, so elementary through high school. Um, and education into uh, higher education, uh, undergrad and graduate. And so this really is my passion. So if I go off on a tangent or use some uh, language that is not clear, stop me and say, what does that mean? Um, and I'll be happy to explain it because special education really um, has its own jargon right? Just like the medical field and things like that. And you really need to know what acronyms and, um, you know, terms mean. And so we're not going to have time in this short uh, training to kind of explain everything. But I did share um, some uh, resources with Sue uh, yesterday um, with staff, but you also um, would benefit from having uh, those resources too. Um, so the cost is I would go ahead and, and give those, uh, give that packet to them because it has a glossary um, defining terms that I'm going to mention and will be in this presentation as well as like an acronym uh, list to explain exactly what everything means. And trust me, as a parent of a child with disabilities, it really is going to come in handy uh, for you. Um, if you ever find yourself um, in one of these meetings that we're going to discuss. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to apologize now. I'm working with two monitors. And so if I'm looking up and looking down, it's because I'm trying to see your beautiful faces, which is um, at the monitor above my presentation. And so I'll be looking down uh, where the camera is. So I apologize um, for that in advance. So let me go ahead and try and share my screen. Can you see that? Yes? Awesome. I'm going to try to make sure that I can see all your faces. So let me expand. Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. So, Stu mentioned this is SPED 101. That is what I uh, titled it uh, initially. But really, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can support um, your student um, that you are advocating for, that your uh, cost is for. And um, we'll start on the general education side and then move into special education. And so we're going to frame it um, using the response to intervention kind of pyramid, which all school districts um, pretty much reference. Um, and I'll show that to you in a little bit. So uh, we're going to go over briefly uh, what an SAP and an SSP process um, is and refers to. And then we're going to uh, discuss Section 504 plans um, and when that might be appropriate. Those are all on the general education side. And then the bulk of this presentation will be on the uh, special education services. And because it's a lot of information and we only have two hours, I encourage you to take care of yourself. I removed the built-in break from this because it's uh, usually three hours or more as a presentation. If you need to take a break, use the restroom, grab something to eat, coffee, whatever, go ahead and do that. Um, just go ahead and um, uh, turn your camera off uh, when you leave uh, the room and then rejoin us, okay? So 
let's move forward. So this is the pyramid. Oh, and some of my pointers, uh, my text is missing, but it's all right. So this is the response to intervention pyramid. And so really at the base, what's missing, I'm not sure why, uh, are universal support. So if you think about um, the widest part of the pyramid, the universal supports are, um, takes up about 80% uh, of supports that are available to all students, general education students, students who have a Section 504 plan, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, and students who qualify for special education services. Um, and so what that looks like is they should be culturally relevant interventions and support that could be, um, you know, extra time. It could be, you know, uh, kind of uh, small group instruction, you know, for every student available in, you know, a class, you know, a, a teacher working with small groups in the back of the room and, you know, the students switch uh, in and out so that they each get a little more support versus say 30 students in a classroom and everybody is receiving the same instruction at one time and you don't know as a teacher whether that student is really um, understanding the curriculum or the instruction that you're giving. And so maybe, you know, you take, you know, four or five at a time in the back of the room. And particularly if you think about like elementary school settings where that is more uh, appropriate and, and possible. Um, the next tier, it's a little more, it's targeted intervention. It's not the most intensive, um, but we'll see another 15 to, you know, 17% um, of students receiving that type of support. And that means, you know, it could be um, reading instruction where they go to the reading specialist because they're a little behind their peers in their classroom. And so they need very specific interventions around certain topics. It could be reading, it could be behaviorally. We see a lot of students who are um, having trouble uh, you know, meeting the expectations behaviorally in the classroom, particularly at the elementary level. Um, and then at the top of the tier, that red uh, tip, um, targeted intensive instruction, and that's really reserved for special education, if you think about that, right? Students who really need some sort of um, modification, very specific accommodations that are written down in a plan and uh, implemented by specialists. Uh, throughout the school or the district so that they can receive educational benefit. Um, and you'll hear me say educational benefit probably throughout this presentation. That's a legal term, legal special education term. Um, and what that means is, um, you know, built into the law, special education law, is this idea of educational benefit where a student should be able to go to school, you know, public school settings in particular, where they can uh, you know, receive instruction and learn making progress that is observable, um, which would amount to educational benefit. Is what the student is learning in the classroom or doing during the school day benefiting them educationally? Is it leading them to make success or progress in their educational journey? And that could be to, you know, progress to the next you know, grade level, it could be to be on track for graduation. If we're talking about high school level, it could be to have appropriate social skills, et cetera. Educational benefit really encompasses everything that happens in the school day um, that uh, we expect students um, and young people to kind of know and understand. So when they are, you know, post-secondary, they can, uh, you know, contribute um, as citizens. So think about like that. It, it, it's very broad, um, but it uh, is within the law. And so there are ways that, you know, judges and um, folks who kind of monitor special education services um, look to determine whether a district is providing educational benefit to a student. Ah, there are my markers. <laughs> I didn't click quickly enough. Okay, we're going to skip that. So if we use the pyramid um, model um, and think about the universal supports and everything um, available to every student and, and family, 
um, really one way that is built in to uh, educational uh, settings is this idea of teacher conferences, right? And so this is um, an opportunity as an ed rights holder um, if you have educational rights for your students. Um, and actually, before I move forward, how many of you do have educational rights um, for the students that you are accosted to? You can just raise your hand on the screen or use the Zoom uh, function. Okay, so not all of you, a couple of you. Okay, um, so this will uh, make sense if you have educational rights for your student and if you don't, but maybe you might in the future for either the current uh, student that you are the CASA for, or if you have a, a different student and, uh, you know, case in the future that you may um, receive educational rights for that student. So for those of you who don't have ed rights, ed rights is really when the judge um, determines that perhaps the biological parent or whomever has educational rights for the students um, currently um, may not be the best person to make educational decisions for that particular student, and therefore they need another person to step in and advocate for them. And this is really important for students who have um, learning differences um, or who, you know, really need um, an adult to, you know, kind of be their eyes and ears and speak up for them so that they have a positive uh, and successful educational journey. And in special education law, this is built into the law where an educational rights holder is a required team member throughout the process um, and the journey of students receiving special education. So uh, going back to the teacher conference. So all students um, have access to this, they should. Um, and this is really an opportunity for uh, the teacher and other staff at the school um, to kind of build a relationship with the educational rights holder. It's usually a parent um, or it could be the person that the student is um, living with. If you are an educational rights holder, you probably are flagged in the system um, as someone who should be notified regarding uh, parent-teacher conferences typically happens, uh, you know, twice a year, and that would include the formal teacher conferences as well as any kind of um, meeting where they're discussing additional supports and interventions for your student, and we're going to talk about those next. So, a student assistance program, that's the SAP part that I mentioned um, on the second slide of objectives. And this is um, kind of an intervention strategy that seeks to bring together on the school staff side, um, providers at the school site. And it really is an opportunity to focus on a bunch of students who may be um, exhibiting some, you know, I don't wanna say delays, but they're a little behind, maybe academically, socially, or behaviorally. Um, and it's enough concern that the staff are going to be discussing them and thinking about ways that they can kind of provide some additional support and intervention. Um, and so this is not all the way at the bottom, but think about in the middle of that green tier, close to the base of the pyramid where all students could access this type of support, okay? And the idea is, and the goal is to kind of help them catch up to their peers in class. And it's only for school staff, school site staff. So parents are not uh, invited to the SAT. Parents would be invited to an SST, the Student Success Team meeting. And that is a school site team um, that seeks to use kind of positive problem solving and intervention to really boost um, and support students who are exhibiting, um, you know, some delays or academic struggles or behavioral struggles. And if you think about it at the elementary level, it could be socially, um, you know, they're exhibiting maybe uh, difficulty focusing, following directions and rules in class. Um, they could be behind in reading or math, you know, things like that. Um, and so they're going to invite the parents or the educational rights holder to a meeting and devise a plan. And they're gonna 
codify it. So it's gonna be written down and agreed to by the educational rights holder. And the individuals at the SST are gonna include um, parent or ed rights holder. Depending on how old the student is, the student could be invited, uh, particularly middle school, high school level. Um, teachers, a school site administrator who has kind of decision-making power and understands what is available at the school site to offer as a support, right? Because the last thing they wanna do is say, oh yeah, this student needs um, you know, this kind of special intervention and they don't have it anymore because it's been removed from the budget, something like that. So the administrator is very important. Um, sometimes they invite uh, community-based organizations who might be able to provide additional support that are not available, say, um, through the district general fund, but maybe they have a contract or a memor uh, memorandum of understanding with the CBO. Um, we often see this, say, uh, for mental health services, so some counseling to students, things like that. Um, and sometimes a school psychologist uh, is also a part of this team, particularly if there have been um, some observations, uh, you know, about the students that, you know, staff are concerned that, you know, if this SST does not meet the needs of a student, we need to kind of track data and get, um, you know, professional uh, opinion about whether a referral to special education or a higher level of intervention is appropriate. And so you may see them at this meeting. Don't panic. <laughs> it doesn't mean, um, you know, the house is on fire just yet. They're just kind of preparing themselves in case it moves in that direction. So it's, it's a positive thing sometimes for the psychologist to be at the table because you want somebody who has been um, in the process from the beginning once they reach to uh, potential time for assessment, if that makes sense, okay? And so, like I said, this is gonna be a codified document that ed rights holders uh, agree to, and it's gonna have some very specific uh, intervention uh, spelled out in the plan. And then the team will meet uh, periodically to determine if the interventions that were agreed to in this SSC meeting are helping. Hopefully they are. If they're not, then there's probably going to be a referral to a higher level of intervention moving up the pyramid. Um, so more uh, targeted intervention, very specific to the student. Um, and after the SSC, something that may happen is moving into what is a Section 504 plan. And a Section 504 plan is still on the general education side of the house, um, but it does come from very specific law. Um, and you probably are familiar with it, or you may have heard of it, um, maybe not in education, but it's everywhere in society. So uh, education, housing, transportation, you name it. Um, and it comes from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and it states uh, it provides services to students who have a physical or mental impairment that substantially impairs a major life activity. And some examples of this, uh, of qualifying disabilities could be asthma, allergies, a diabetic student, ADD or ADHD. And if a student qualifies, then the school district or the school, if you're talking about uh, charter or a private school even, will prepare a plan that outline, outlines some special services um, or accommodations, could be some modifications depending on the level of need um, that will be implemented to assist the student in receiving educational benefit or accessing the curriculum, right? And being able to uh, participate and contribute in class or throughout the school day. Um, and so, the difference between a Section 504 plan and an IEP, which we're gonna talk about next, and that falls under special education law, is that students who qualify for special education services under special education law, which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, you see that on the screen, those students qualify, they must qualify under 13 eligibilities, which we're gonna talk about um, next. But students uh, who qualify under Section 504, it really covers a broader group of students than special education law. Um, and a Section 504 plan 
does require that the edu uh, educational rights holder also be at the table. It's also going to be a codified document and plan put into place, and it's going to be monitored um, at the school site. Um, there are specific um, sanctions, I guess, if a 504 plan is not implemented, but I'm not going to get into those right now. They look uh, very different um, than special education law. Um, but the thing to remember about uh, Section 504 is that it can be implemented temporarily or permanently for a student. And so what that means is that let's say you have a student who, you know, has an accident and, you know, breaks a limb, they break their leg and they are now, you know, on crutches or they're in a boot or something like that. Their mobility is compromised, um, you know, for a couple of months or something, you know, six to eight weeks. Um, they could put, the school site could put a section 504 plan into place that gives that student special seating. So if you think back to those very uncomfortable desks that may be in public schools, and you know it would be hard for a student to kind of navigate that, they can get preferential seating in the front of the class to help it um, help them easily, you know, more easily navigate the classroom setting or around school. You know, you can even have a 504 plan that allows students who, you know, may need uh, occasional breaks you know, to kind of calm themselves down. If you think about self-monitoring, um, you know, they need to take a breather. Um, you know, I've seen 504 plans where it's written in, the student is allowed to go take a walk, um, get a drink of water, uh, you know, for five minutes and then come back after they have reset themselves and rejoin the class. And it's no big deal, right? You know, if you have a student who, you know, is a runner or elopes, that's not a good accommodation for that student, but that kind of accommodation would be very appropriate for a student who is responsible. And, you know, you can trust that student to, you know, go down the hall, take a quick walk and come back and still, you know, attend to what's happening in the class, if that makes sense. I'm gonna pause here. Any questions so far? See, um, in the chat, Mark asked if you could repeat the definition of the IDEA? I'm gonna get to it, Mark. And I'm sorry I didn't see uh, that in chat. Sue, if you could monitor the chat, that would be great because I see yeah. the little flags coming up, but- um, Sure thing. And then Libby has a question. Yes. Yeah, I'm curious about, um, like it says here that ADHD is a qualifying disability for um, a 504 plan, but mm -hmm. isn't it also a qualifying disability for an IEP? So I'm it curious is. Like what the difference is or like why they would get one over the other. What a great question. Um, and I'll say a little bit more when we get to uh, special education, but essentially the difference is um, for a section 504, it really means that, um, you know, these kind of accommodations, um, the student is fine in general education, you know, they're mostly fine during the day. They don't need, um, you know, their ADD or ADHD is not severe enough that they would uh, qualify or need um, very intensive kind of interventions and accommodations, if that makes sense. Um, special education, uh, in order to qualify under IDEA, it has to be 13 very specific eligibility. And ADHD is not one of them, but it falls under one of the eligibilities. And I'm gonna point that one out. Um, and so we do see some students uh, with ADD or ADHD, particularly the medical diagnosis of that, have either a section 504 and some have an IEP. And typically the ones who have an IEP, they may have multiple disabilities, so, you know, the ADHD in combination with another kind of learning difference or need um, is really impacting the student's ability to receive full educational benefit um, during the day. And the students that I have seen um, who qualify uh, for special education services who have an IEP, who have ADD, ADHD, are the very severe kind of externalizing uh, students where it, it you may not even think it's ADHD. It may mirror another disability because it's so severe. There are 
serious behavioral problems, right, that are impacting uh, the student in the classroom. Um, they may, you know, have some aggressive behaviors. They may, attention and focus is very severe where you have to, um, you know, they may need to be on a very specific schedule, um, you know, and transitions, things like that. It, it's really more, um, it's the students who are exhibiting more severe need um, that may qualify for an IEP. Um, but also usually there's something else at play, right? So maybe academically they're behind um, as far as uh, instruction, right? Because you can have ADD and ADHD and be completely grade level, right? Um, and then sometimes students are not because the ADHD is so severe that they have fallen behind because they have not been able to attend and fully participate in class? That's a really great question because you, you do have students who uh, qualify for both. You also see that uh, sometimes with autism and, and most people don't think about that because you have to qualify very specifically for an IEP under autism and um, we're gonna talk about that. Great question. Other questions? Yes, Daniel. Yeah. Um my understanding has been that uh, just uh, with even if you don't have a, a education rights, even if you're not an education rights holder, but just by the fact that you're a CASA, that you uh, can and maybe should uh, attend any of these meetings that you're talking about, you can participate as a CASA without having a uh, rights holder, without being a right. You can, you can. Um, an ed rights holder would be required to uh, participate because they have, um, you know, that's who the district is going to be uh, contacting for all things educational, right, um, in the school setting. So if you, um, and I, I definitely encourage CASAs, even if you don't have educational rights, um, educational rights of the student, um, to have that relationship with the ed rights holder, whomever it is, um, so that they feel comfortable inviting you or even adding you as a contact uh, through the school district, but that would be their responsibility and their choice um, to do that. But absolutely, if they want you to participate, please do because um, every student needs multiple advocates um, at the table on their behalf, particularly when we're talking about young minors, right? Others? Okay. Going. So, um, getting back to Section 504. Um, so, just a quick review. Section 504 is a federal civil rights law that protects individuals um, with disabilities from discrimination. And I mentioned that it's in other settings um, in society. So, we're talking about education, but it does uh, mirror in other places like housing, transportation, as I said earlier. Um, and it's going to be the mental or physical impairment. Now, you may be asking yourself, how do you determine what, uh, when it says substantially limits one or more major life activities? Like who gets to define that? Um, it's, it's, it's fairly subjective and broad. Yes, it is, which is why Section 504 plans, um, you know, typically cover more individuals. Um, than you know, special education law because it really determines what uh, you know is a major uh, life activity. And so if you think about students, um, that that's a lot, really. It, anything that has or impacts their ability to navigate, um, you know, the school setting or impact their educational journey, really could be considered and included in a Section 504. Uh, plan. And so if you are the person, you know, advocating on behalf of a 504 plan, you know, really think about, uh, you know, in preparation for this meeting, how is the student being impacted by, um, you know, the manifestations of whatever uh, learning difference or disability that they have? Um, and so what I mean by that is, you know, uh, executive functioning, for instance, the ability to um, really kind of self-organize and, uh, you know, think about what you need to do. Well, first of all, what you need 
uh, tools or resources that you need as a student to organize yourself throughout the day, whether that be, is your homework in your backpack? Have you, you know, written down all of your homework assignments in your homework plan that most schools now give to students, right? Have you copied it down correctly? Do you have pencils? Do you have notebooks? Um, you know, or is your paper balled up in your backpack and when you get home, you can't find your homework or your notes that you took in school? You know, executive functioning um, has an example like that that we typically see in students. That impacts a student's ability to receive educational benefit because they're constantly losing their materials. And so when it comes to doing homework or following through on assignments um, from their teacher, they don't do it because they have not, they don't have the ability to organize themselves mentally, um, which transfers over into the school setting and academic, right? That's just one example. Uh, it may seem like, oh, that's not a big deal. It is a big deal. Um, if you think about as an adult, when we are uh, not organized or we feel kind of discombobulated, you know, the dominoes that fall um, when we don't have things in order, right? It really impacts students because they don't have the tools yet to know how to organize themselves. Um, they are, well, they should be learning that in school, particularly the younger they are they are, right? By high school, we expect a little more organization, but if they have ADD or ADHD, um, as Libby asked, they still may not have it, right? And they may be struggling even into adulthood and for the rest of their life. And so those kind of accommodations in a 504 plan are very, very important, um, and even in an IEP. So some possible reasons for a Section 504 plan. Um, chronic and or life-threatening medical conditions. Um, these could be uh, present at the beginning of the school year or they could happen during the school year. Um, you know, we talked about the SAP and the SST processes. So maybe the school has already been, uh, you know, kind of eyeing and observing a student and they've tried to implement some interventions and they have not been successful. That could be a reason to think about a Section 504 plan. It's moving up the, uh, the pyramid as far as interventions. Maybe uh, school staff or educational rights holder or the parent is um, observing some kind of emotional or social changes uh, within the student um, that they want to address, right? Because you can see if it's rooted in something at school, bullying or you know, you, they change uh, behaviors, right? You just, you notice a drastic change that may not be associated with, uh, you know, middle school puberty where everybody is changing, right? But something that is very drastic and you're like, hmm, something's going on. Um, uh, concern about not moving to the next grade level. So in danger of failing a grade. Um, some behavioral issues uh, is, comes up very frequently um, for Section 504 plans, um, depending on the student. Um, and again, that is a uh, behavior that inter uh, interferes with them accessing education. Occasional cut up or, uh, you know, when kids are being kids, that is not a reason for a Section 504 plan, but something that is consistent. Um, absenteeism also can be addressed. Uh, under a Section 504 plan. And so uh, if you think about uh, students where, um, you know, if the school has noticed that they um, typically were on time and, you know, you notice a drastic change, maybe they're coming late uh, regularly or they're out for the full day. Um, what is going on? They can talk about um, some potential interventions that can be in play, such as a grace period for the beginning of the school day. Like if they are, you know, routinely late, at least 15 minutes, gonna build in, uh, you know, a grace period of say 15, 20 minutes into the section 504 plan. So they're not dinged or marked absent, you know, throughout the school day, which can uh, trigger kind of SARB and other issues um, unnecessarily when we know something is happening um, at the home front that is causing this, right? So a definite way to, you know, 
support the student in being successful while also recognizing that uh, a change is happening, maybe on the home front or just within the students. Um, and so if you think about our foster youth, um, they go through a lot of changes, right? Um, that may cause uh, differences in behavior. It could be a change in home placement, uh, trauma background, um, whether uh, recent um, or uh, previously that caused them to go into the system. Um, those things uh, are recurring. They keep coming up and can be, uh, you know, manifesting in behaviors. Um, and what educators uh, say often is that behavior is a form of communication. And what that means is when a, a student is acting out, they're trying to tell adults something. And it's up to adults to really kind of tap in and tune in to see what is going on. And uh, Section 504 plan, SSTs, uh, and the SAP process are ways to kind of tune in to the needs of the students. I'm going to pause there before we move to special education. Any other questions about what we've talked about so far? Just as a reminder, those are all on the general education side of the house. So SAP, SST process available to every student. A section 504 plan not available to every student, but still on the general education side and for students who are in need of interventions and support um, that don't necessarily rise to the level of needing special education services. Any questions? Okay, let's keep moving. So what is special education specifically? Well, it is instruction specifically designed to address the educational and related developmental needs of children with disabilities. Um, and that does include early intervention services uh, for infants and toddlers, preschool, for students um, starting at the age of three in the school system, in public school. So zero to three, you have the regional centers of California where uh, children um, can access uh, supports and services on the side of the regional center. We're not gonna talk about the regional center in this particular um, training, but uh, probably one of your uh, case managers, uh, case supervisors can um, discuss that with you and, and help you navigate if you have uh, a child that young um, and have some concerns. There are services and support um, available to them. Starting at age three, a student is going to enter into the public school system. And if they have a learning disability um, that is already showing, or maybe not a learning disability, but a disability, um, you can go to uh, your local school district um, and request assessment, or they will be transitioned from the regional center if they're already a client and referred over to a uh, special education department in the local district. Um, services go all the way up to either high school diploma or the age of 22. Um, and so the difference there is if you have a student who does qualify for special education services, but they are grade level or have been able to kind of uh, matriculate through the general education setting and they receive a high school diploma, great. That's what we want from most of, if not all of our students who are capable, um, then services stop when they receive that diploma. Usually this is gonna be around 18, sometimes 19, particularly for foster youth because they have that fifth year right. Um, for students uh, who are more severe uh, in their disability um, and they're not on diploma track, meaning they would most likely be on a certificate of completion track. They're probably more focused on independent living skills, um, you know, kind of uh, the basic academic skills. And maybe they're, you know, kind of focused more on getting a job, being independent, post-secondary, they can receive services um, to the age of 22. Um, and that's all on the district's dot um, because they're entitled to a free and appropriate public education, uh, which the acronym is FAPE. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that through the rest of the training. 
Um, and so for students with IEPs, instruction is based on the core curriculum. Um, and so what that means is IEP teams should be basing goals um, and instruction for a student receiving special education services based on the grade level curriculum and modifying it to the point where a student can still access grade level curriculum. And so sometimes I've seen for more severe students, you know, they are, you know, high school age, but maybe, uh, you know, cognitively, they, you know, their reading is well behind, they're at an elementary level, or, um, you know, they're not able to access the high school uh, level curriculum um, right now because they're so far behind. Districts can modify that high school grade curriculum. So let's, for example, say science, um, they can modify it and put it um, at an academic level where the student can access it and still be learning um, what their peers are learning, just using kind of different uh, language to access, but the terms and the ideas, the concepts should be the same. Um, I'll be completely honest and transparent. Not every district or school does that um, because it does take um, time and knowledge uh, and dedication to do that. Um, and so uh, some of our districts are uh, under-resourced and I'll just put it like that. Um, where that doesn't always happen. So now that we know what special education uh, is um, in the law, let's talk about the law. IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, um, also referred to uh, in places in this particular training as the IDEIA Act. Individuals with Disabilities Improvement Act because it was updated in 2004 to add some additional uh, clarification around rights. But IDEA, IDEIA, same law we're talking about here. And what does it say? Well, it guarantees that all children with disabilities receive that term I just used, FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. What that means is regardless of what a student needs to help them access their public school education and the curriculum there, it's free to them and their family or educational rights holder. It's on the district's dime because they get money to assist students um, who qualify for services to access the curriculum, right? So it should never be uh, discussed or said, well, we can't afford that or we, you know, that's not something we do or whatever in a meeting to um, a family or the ed rights holder um, of the student, um, which would prevent them from uh, gaining educational benefit. That's just not a thing um, that should ever come up in a meeting. Um, IDA also guarantees um, the least restrictive environment uh, for students um, with special needs, meaning the environment that least restricts them um, from gaining uh, educational and accessing educational benefit among their general education here. So that is misleading in a way because when we think of least restrictive environment, I think most people automatically go to general education setting. That's not necessarily the case. The least restrictive environment is very specific to the individual student. So for some students, the least restrictive environment may be a student, um, a special day class very specific to uh, deaf or blind students, right? It may be a special day class that has built in uh, schedules and instruction for students on the autism spectrum, uh, you know, or maybe who are, uh, you know, students who need a counseling enriched program, right? It's very individualized. For most students, we're talking about the general education classroom, but not all. So I don't want to um, leave you with the idea that you should always be uh, looking toward the general education setting for every student. Sometimes that's just not the case because that student may be overwhelmed in a general education student that will prevent them from actually learning in that environment because of that student's disabilities and the needs that they have. Um, 
something that I like in the special education law is that it guarantees a racially and culturally unbiased assessment um, you know, that is given in the student's native language or mode of communication. So if you think about a student who reads Braille or, you know, needs to listen uh, to the assessment, whatever, they need to be assessed in the way that they would um, perform best on that assessment. And that includes language. Um, and the culturally, the racially and culturally unbiased assessment should be built in to the uh, protocols that the district um, chooses uh, because that is a part of the law. And so all districts have to follow that. And so there are specific protocols, um, but as educational rights holder um, or friend to educational rights holder, if you have concerns about the tests that are administered and they should be telling you when they uh, review them, um, bring them up if you feel that there is some sort of bias um, at play. Um, either in the test or in the um, uh, the analysis um, of the test, right? Um, the reading of the results. Um, it also guarantees that the ed rights holder must be included in the IEP team and at the meeting um, when decisions are made about the student. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It also guarantees uh, due process um, and complaint procedures. Um, to ensure the rights of students. So that means if there is disagreement uh, between the school district and Ed Rights Holder, um, there is a process uh, built into the law that you can follow and districts must follow also um, so that you can come to some sort of agreement or, or at least you know, um, go the legal route so that you can um, address it, right? If you just can't find agreement between uh, the district uh, and yourself as it. Those 13 eligibilities that I've mentioned a number of times, here they are. Um, autism, deafblind, deafness, emotional disturbance, a hearing impairment, multiple disabilities, an intellectual disability, which uh, California uses ID. It's formally uh, referred to as mental retardation, but we uh, in California have removed that from uh, our verbiage legally. Um, orthopedic impairment, other health impairment. Remember uh, Libby's question about ADD, ADHD, 504 plan versus IEP? Other health impairment is where you're gonna find most students qualifying under ADD or ADHD. And so the hint there is the health part. Students who come with a medical diagnosis of some sort that is not one of these others uh, may qualify for special education services under OHI, other health impairment. Specific learning disability, we also see a number of students qualify under this uh, category. And that's typically, um, you know, a student uh, may be a number of grade levels behind, reading, math, something like that, where they are not at grade level um, in comparison to their peers. Um, and something uh, is preventing them uh, from their processing or something like that. Dyslexia may be found under a specific learning disability. Uh, a speech and language impairment, traumatic brain injury, or visual impairment. And so these are the very specific eligibilities that a student must qualify to have an IEP. Um, and so Section 504, more broad, could be a bunch of things. For an IEP, very specifically, they must qualify under these. And interestingly enough, these 13 eligibilities, not every student who has one of these uh, disabilities or you would think should qualify under the eligibility does because it is specifically uh, meant that they qualify if their disability impacts their ability to receive educational benefits under the special education law, um, if that makes sense. So I, I gave the example earlier, not every student on the autism spectrum is gonna qualify under autism because they're looking at very specific uh, reasons um, or uh, criteria under each eligibility that would rise to the occasion to make a student meet that eligibility. Um, 
and autism just happens to be one of those that is very specific. So we see a lot of students who are, uh, to use an old term, quote, high functioning on the autism spectrum that don't meet the eligibility for an IEP under autism, but maybe they are referred back down to a section 504 plan because they are, you know, they're able to access the general education curriculum and they may need just some accommodations. They don't need, you know, curriculum modification or anything like that. Does that make sense? We're good? Okay. I know this is a lot and I'm just, I'm going full speed ahead. So if you need to take a break, go ahead, take care of yourself and raise your hand um, if you want to interrupt or you need clarification of something. Yes. We do have one question in the yes. chat from Wendy. Okay, great. Um, sometimes kids who have qualified for regional center stay regional center client after they turn three and yes. they have an IEP too. How does that happen? Great question. Yes, so regional center, when a child uh, stays with the regional center, which absolutely happens. My child is still a regional center client. Um, he's now a young adult, but uh, for students with more severe disabilities, um, who's, uh, if you think about whose disabilities are going to impact them for life um, very significantly, um, they may qualify uh, for services well past three. The transition um, at three years old into the district is for those uh, students whose uh, services that they've been receiving from the regional center are now covered under the school district. So for example, speech therapy um, or occupational therapy, students can receive those services from a school district um, free of charge. And so uh, the regional centers don't want to kind of overlap uh, the services um, where a student can be getting them for free when they're going to school. Um, you know, services uh, such as um, like respite uh, can happen from, can be given from a regional center where uh, the student's disabilities are so severe that, um, you know, the family, uh, you know, devotes a lot of time and energy to the caregiving of that particular child and the regional center has deemed that they need a break from time to time and there's no one to give them a break. And so they may uh, qualify for respite services through the regional center uh, where uh, an outside person who's trained comes in and gives that caregiver a break and, and takes the child, you know, they may stay with them in the home and that the caregiver or the parent has the ability to go, you know, uh, do some self care. Um, another example, uh, regional center is um, like summer camps or, you know, after school care, they may uh, pay for or agree to provide after school care for uh, a student with disability if there are no uh, care providers that um, that child can access because of their disabilities. And so they need a specialized program. Um, they may qualify for that under the regional center. And so uh, what I would say, Wendy, is that, um, it always helps to ask whether your student or child uh, qualifies to continue on as a regional center client because their disability is not going anywhere, right? So they, they, they will opt to transition them uh, into the under the school district uh, automatically, but it, it does not hurt to ask and kind of um, push back a little bit. If you know that, um, the student uh, would benefit um, from staying on as a client. And, and the worst that can happen is that they say no, and there's an appeal process for the regional center as well. Is there another question? I see. Yes, uh, Cindy asked, how is what track a child is on determined and how do we know if gen ed diploma track is the right level or if more severe independent living should be in place? Ah, uh, what a great question. Um, so I'm gonna respond to this, but my bias is going to show. And what I mean by bias is that I'm a parent of a child with disabilities um, and who you know, received services uh, before three years old with a regional center client, still a regional center client and you know, went through school. So 
a school district is typically going to be looking at um, writing in the plan, their IEP plan, the actual document, uh, looking at transitional uh, services, uh, certainly before age 16 um, in the IEP. Uh, between middle school and high school, they will be looking at uh, the perform academic performance of the students to determine are they on track to, in entering high school, uh, be at grade level, right? Or are they just a little, you know, maybe one grade level behind or two where they can kind of catch up or, you know, curriculum can be modified a little bit, but they still can grasp uh, and retain the concept, which would allow them to go ahead and be on diploma track, right? Um, or, are they kind of more severe where, you know, uh, within the allotted uh, years that are left in a uh, public school setting, uh, particularly uh, typical for uh, diploma, you know, are they able to catch up? And so the school district will be thinking about that, uh, particularly around middle school uh, to see, uh, to recommend a track. Now, that's the district side parent side and advocate side of me always recommend that uh, you push um, and keep a student on diploma track, meaning you're not changing the placement of that student out of the general education academic courses um, for as long as possible. Because, uh, you know, students show their abilities at different times. And so, yes, uh, you know, we have kindergarten through 12th grade. That's um, our model of, you know, in our education system. But who's to say that that student can't um, have their aha moment, their epiphany, and kind of really begin to blossom later on in their educational journey, where they then begin to, you know, make a turn, right? Because so many things impact whether a student is um, kind of on grade level, like trauma, right? So if you think about foster youth, so many things can impact academic performance. And I know that firsthand, I was a foster youth and you know, I, I, I made it through school, I did fine, you know, but uh, yeah, there were some struggles there depending on what was happening in my homework. And so I say never give up on a student because they can surprise you. Uh, particularly later in life. Uh, I saw Mark's hand, but Cindy's hand is up. Is this following up on that question? Yeah, and maybe it's too detailed for, for this. And, and Dr. Savage, you know, I consulted with you on my uh, youth um, a couple of weeks ago. And and uh, they're, they're on, um, from what I'm gathering here, just like a diploma track, but I can never see how the goals are translating to get them to the grade level. And when I ask about it, well, if they meet these goals, will they be at grade level next year? The, it's just so ambiguous from the uh, t uh, teachers and providers. It's like, well, she may never get there. And does that mean that she's going to be, be on that other track that you mentioned? So That's a great question. And it is detailed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, maybe if you can remind me to come back to this question uh, later in the training, or we can, um, you know, you can make an appointment with me yeah. or I can try to address that. Um, and I think Sue probably will make this uh, training available. I know we're recording it, but I'll um, save it as a PDF. So you actually have the slides also yeah. to review and the support um, or the resources in the packet also will give uh, more information to kind of address that. Thank um, you. Yeah. Mark, thanks for waiting. Well, I'm reluctant to ask this question because I think we could take up the next two hours answering it, but a situation, a 19-year-old um, uh, foster child still in the system who reads at the sixth grade level and was passed over passed up every grade because the teachers couldn't deal with it um, uh, in Stockton and in Bakersfield. Uh, how does one, or is it possible for one to uh, use the 
uh, Section 504 of the Rehab Act or the IDEA um, to go to a local school, say a junior college or some other institution, and demand that this uh, individual um, be given hands-on education so he could at least read Mm-hmm. And has a high school diploma because they just booted him out. Um, yeah. And ha- and ha- get special attention to learn how to read, at least at his age level. Yeah, such a great question. I remember you, Mark, from the open house. Um, this is a story. Did I ask of- that question then, too? <laughs> uh, well, we talked about it, and I told you to make yeah. uh, an appointment for office hours. And I still want you to make an appointment for office hours. Um this is a great question because we see this uh, happen for a lot of students, particularly foster youth, um, because they're moving uh, home placement, which impacts their academics, right? Um, you know, it's no fault of their own. And the schools have, uh, yeah, they have just kind of passed students on, particularly of color or uh, with the students with disabilities and foster youth. Um, we also see this English language learners where they just pass them on and they have not addressed uh, the student needs um, fully while they are at the grade level. And so we see students, you know, like um, your student, Mark, uh, you know, adult with a nice high school diploma who struggle with reading. So um, the answer is because this student already has a diploma, they technically have exited uh the public school system so you can't go to a school district necessarily and and try to get some services however if the student has already had an iep in their past or a section 504 what you can do is get a copy of those records from their last school district who has those on file. And if you're the ed rights holder, you should have uh, access to that. Or because um, they're 19, they're an adult, they can request those records themselves and, and, and receive them uh, within five days by law and take it to the local community college and meet with the D- Disability Resource Center at that campus. And every community college has it, every uh, four-year university, particularly in the state of California, has a Disability Resource Center. Take those, uh, that Section 504 or the IEP and meet with that uh, department um, because they have specialists to review those documents and they will be able to tell you the accommodations and services available at that community college or that educational institute that can be put in place for uh, the student, for that individual. Now, it's not going to look like an IEP with certain services, but they do have a wealth of wonderful accommodations, at, particularly at the community college level and, and some you know, of our four-year universities, like Cal State University East Bay has a program specifically designed for individuals on the autism spectrum, um, including uh, who wanna live in the dorm, right? So you can find really great uh, resources um, if you ask, and I would start with the Disability Resource uh, Center because they're gonna ask for that document, um, the most recent document um, that you have for the student. They're gonna take a look at all of the uh, uh, supports and accommodations that were built in there and tell you what they have available. And it's different okay. at each campus. I, I am great. gonna make a follow-up appointment with you through my program director at CASA. Great, sounds good. Thank you. All right, let's keep going. We're at 11.07. Um, because I want to try and get some more questions at the end. So in addition to IDEA, uh, California Ed Code also provides some, uh, you know, support for uh, students with disabilities. Um, not every state, but, you know, I'm as a native, I'm going to say the great state of California. Not perfect, but it typically leans on the side of providing more support and being more inclusive. Um, than some other states. And so again, it aligns with uh, uh, the services up to age 22, birth through 22, um, and also has some specific rights uh, pertaining to timelines for access uh, of records. So I just mentioned the five days, uh, requesting uh, educational uh, file 
or folder um, that's within five days built into California Education Code. Um, so timelines regarding access to records and services. And we're going to talk about those timelines uh, coming up. So let's say uh, you have a student who does not have special education services. They, they do not have an IEP. You've been through the SAP, the SST process. Um, perhaps they, you know, uh, dabbled with a 504 plan um, and just need a little more additional support. Or maybe they did not have a Section 504 plan because it is evident that the student needs very specific accommodations or modifications in an educational program where a Section 504 plan is not enough. Um, and what I will say now is that um, although to have an IEP, you must meet the eligibility of one of those, you know, under one of those 13 areas. For a Section 504, it's more broad. But every student who qualifies for a Section 504 plan um, doesn't qualify for an IEP, but every student who qualifies for an IEP qualifies for a Section 504 plan and the accommodations and supports under that. It's kind of, uh, it just automatically uh, gets wrapped into an IEP, if that makes sense. So if a student has a Section 504 plan, um, you know, and they've qualified for special education services and an IEP, you can wrap those supports from the 504 plan right into an IEP with no problem, okay? Um, so where to begin? Well, you can refer the student for assessment as educational rights holder or as CASA without ed rights because you know the student. Um, so a parent, ed rights holder, a school site staff uh, member, the student's pediatrician, social workers, dependency attorneys in this case, um, or other professionals um, kind of with knowledge and background of the student or who have knowledge of a typically developing student at the same age, right? You can't have any Joe Schmo off the street say, oh, that student needs to be referred to special education and they have absolutely no background in, you know, child development or student development or age appropriate, you know, grade level curriculum, right? So they, they must have some knowledge of the student and or of appropriate academic milestones and okay um, and although a referral or request for assessment can be verbal or written please 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 put it in writing <laughs> and the reason you put it in writing is because it ticks off the timeline this is what the, this is just a graphic uh, but it helps Put in a written referral requesting special education assessment. And that kicks off the timeline for the district. They have 15 calendar days from that request to respond either with, yes, we will agree to assess. Here is our assessment plan outlining the areas that we want to assess this student in. Or no, we disagree and we're declining your request for assessment because X, Y, and Z. And they will spell it out on a form in a document that's called a prior written notice. Um, and a prior written notice is the form or document that a school district will formally respond to um, the ed rights holder um, requesting anything. Could be for initial assessment, it could be uh, requesting uh, change in placement or, you know, speech services, what have you. It's going to be in the form of a prior written notice because that's the formal document. And so on record, legally, that's how they're, they need to respond to it. So don't, don't let it be intimidating. Um, it's just uh, the official notice um, that's going to go on record in case it goes to a judge or mediation or what have you that, yes, we formally responded to this request and here it is dated such and such, and these are the explanations that we get, right? So in case there's he said, she said, or they said, they said, um, you know, there's a record, which is why you also want to put everything in writing because the district is going to put everything in writing. And so you want to make sure you have your ducks in a row, just like they try to have their ducks in a row, okay? So 15 calendar days to respond to the request. Once 
let's say they agree to assess, you receive the assessment plan as ed rights holder, and you sign the assessment plan, meaning you agree to the areas that they are recommending to assess in. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about assessments coming up, um, about the importance of getting the initial assessment right from the beginning. Um, then they have 60 calendar days to assess. And by the 60th day, they need to be scheduling and holding the IEP meeting. Uh, to re uh, review the results of that assessment. Um, and we're going to talk about what happens in that meeting and what to look for and, and how you can prepare, okay? And so either the child uh, or the student is found eligible and you're going to be in that meeting and reviewing and then you're going to create an IEP, which is the document with the goals and the services and placement and all of that. Um, I'm going to go over that in detail later. Or they say, this student does not qualify for special education services, and here's why, right? And so they're not going to be offered services because they don't qualify. And ed rights holders can agree with that or accept that, or they can disagree and file an appeal um, regarding uh, that uh, decline of service, okay? Yes, Daniel. Um, what are the uh, what do you recommend you do uh, we should do if um, the uh, timeline isn't held to so the sixty day uh, timeline um, you know in my case has it happened to you long past yeah we're we're you know we started this process uh, last spring we're not done yet okay so I, I just have some clarifying questions because it it depends my advice is depends on the scenario so. Have they not completed the assessment within the 60 days or did they start the meeting at the end of the 60 days and they just haven't completed the document, haven't completed meeting uh, for the IEP? Which um, one? Yeah, it, the, the latter. Um, they, okay. they, well, they didn't complete the assessments in 60 days, that's for sure. And, okay. um, and they haven't uh, submitted or they haven't um, given out the final documents of, of yeah. uh, you know, the IEP and some of the uh, other reports. There's a report that they did, an assessment they did about behavior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still haven't seen that one. So there's a, just a, a lot of, you know, and I don't think any of these people are bad uh, or evil. I think that they, they just are um, under-resourced. Right. Um, yes, good point. Uh, they're probably not uh, intentionally evil. Um, however, being under-resourced or having incompetent staff is not the fault of this student or you as educational rights holder. They still must be in compliance with the law. And so if this happens, you have the right, this is built into your due process and complaint procedure rights under IDEA, you have the right to file a complaint with uh, the California Department of Education. Um, and you can either file a compliance complaint um, because they're outside of the timeline. Um, and that process is found online. Um, I can share that with Sue uh, later, um, the link. Um, that, and you can complete that uh, complaint online as well. And it goes to a special investigator uh, that works for California Department of Education. It's a neutral person who will take a look at uh, what's happening, the record. So they will request all the documents from you as ed rights holder, which is why you always put everything in writing. <laughs> An email counts as a written document. They're gonna ask for everything. You're gonna have to download all of your emails that you sent, um, you know, copies of the meeting notes and documents from the IEP meetings, all the assessments that you have um, that, were, that came from the district. And then they're gonna ask the same thing from the district. What have you given to this ed rights holder? And they're going to compare. And then they're going to determine who's lying and who's not. And if the district is um, out of compliance, and then they will, uh, you know, sanction it. And, you know, it may be that, uh, you know, they will ask you, um, what would, you know, uh, appease you as far as this complaint? What do you want to make you feel better 
um, since the district may or may not be, uh, you know, in compliance. Um, and so you have the opportunity to uh, suggest a way to mitigate it. Um, and doesn't mean you're going to get it, but they will consider it for sure. Um, and then they'll tell uh, the district and they will issue a ruling, um, you know, and they'll send you a copy and the district a copy and the district has, if there are any sanctions, um, that they have to do or actions that they must take, they have to do it immediately and then show proof and send it to that investigator in CDE um, to answer your question, Daniel. And and that's true and part of the process for any uh, compliance issue or when the district is not following the law. Um, you can file a compliance complaint around the implementation uh, timelines, et cetera, of the IEP and special education law. You also can, you know, file to meet with a mediator, have a neutral party um, out of the Office of Administrative Hearings um, for special education to look at the facts and uh, make a ruling. Or you can skip and go straight to an administrative law judge and have them determine, uh, you know, and make a ruling um, based on the case. Um, so you, you have some different options, but I would start there, Daniel, with a compliance complaint. Um, because it sounds like you still don't have the documents that you need. But before you do that, you should probably book uh, an appointment with me in my office hours so we can go over the details of the case. Um, okay, so let's move on because um, we're at 1120 now. So the impact of assessments. I just told you that uh, it really kicks off a uh, special education journey uh, for a child um, or student. And it really is by far one of the most important aspects of the IEP process under special education law. Um, and it really is uh, what determines your student's services, placement, and eligibility. Um, it's the foundation to special education. And it makes the assessment so important, uh, particularly in initial assessment, because um, that will determine uh, for instance, um, who had the question about, uh, I think it was uh, Cindy, uh, say diploma or certificate track, right? So if you think about um, most students are initially assessed for special education when they're younger, right? Uh, elementary or middle and some happen in high school. That is a terrible thing. It means that the school district or school really missed um, their opportunity to identify a student who could use additional support. Um, but most of them are gonna happen when the student is young. And that foundational uh, you know, instruction and academics are going to impact the trajectory and educational journey of that student. Learning to read, right? Uh, basic math skills. Um, those impact the student throughout their life, right? Into adulthood, particularly reading. Right, you need reading for any and everything, um, and and basic math skills and things like that. Even if you're not going to college, you need a job, right? You need to know how to read your paycheck. If you are in retail or whatever, you have to know numbers, right? It, it's really important, um, no matter what you do. Um, and so, getting it right is really important from the beginning. I love this quote. It comes from the Diagnostic Center of Northern California, and it's talking about. Um, assessments. And so differences in the ways in which students of varying cultural background and experience respond to the prescribed conditions of widely used standardized tests are poorly understood. The magnitude of the difference between the average scores of African American students and those of non African American students suggests that these poorly understood differences can play a large role in misclassification of African American students. Why I include this quote is it's speaking to the cultural and racial background. Remember when I was going over what does IDEA guarantee? A racially and culturally unbiased assessment, right? Because it's super important. And when we talk about assessment and uh, you know the protocols, just uh, these standardized tests that are given to students to determine whether they qualify under one of the eligibility, they're standardized and they're normed typically on middle-class white Americans or white individuals. And so when you think about, certainly in California, the population, 
and the students who make up the majority of special education, there's a mismatch. Because even when you are a poor white American, you perform poorly on these standardized tests because the language in the test does not, is not uh, compatible to maybe what you use at home or what you grew up hearing. And so you're naturally going to perform less than your ability. And that impacts how you are seen on paper as a student and what you can do, right? And so if someone is uh, looking at you through a deficit lens based on your scores on this assessment, that lens will continue through the recommendations under certain eligibility, through the recommendations of can they be on diploma track versus certificate of completion, meaning only focus on the needs of uh, independent uh, living skills. The lens will be there when they talk about placement. Can they be in the general education setting or do they need to be in a smaller, removed special day class away from general education students? It's really important. Um, it just impacts everything. Um, and so that's why I'm stressing it because it, it, it's huge. Uh, and Meredith probably knows this about me by now. <laughs> like It's so important to get it right. So this is what is in the law. And I'm not gonna read all of this. I'm gonna read the highlighted term. Um, this is uh, the specifics in special education law about assessment. And it comes directly from the law. And so some things to highlight include, one, that assessment must be administered in a way so that they aren't biased in any way, racially, culturally, and linguistically right, including um, the mode of communication, right? So that's, you see in uh, A and B. And so that means uh, student needs Braille, uh, you know, to be assessed. If they need to be assessed in Spanish um, or Mandarin, Cantonese, uh, Arabic, then they are entitled to do so. And the district must make the arrangements so they are assessed appropriately and in the language and mode of communication where they can perform best, right? Where they are most comfortable, um, you know, communicating it. Um, they also must be done by trained personnel. Um, that's D. Nobody, not just anybody can perform these assessments. They can't, you know, because you have to be specially trained to understand what's in the protocol and what the assessments are actually looking at. You, you must know what you're doing. Right. And so a good example of this um, that a lot of people don't know, there are a number of assessments um, for autism. And so remember, I said not everybody who is on the autism spectrum will qualify under autism for special education services. And there are a number of tests um, that districts can use. One of them is autism rating scales, which most school psychologists are trained to use. And it's far easier. Another one um, is the ADOS, ADOS, the Autism Diagnostic uh, something uh, uh, scale. And school psychologists have to take a special training over a number of days to administer the ADOS. It's more accurate um, and very specific, uh, you know, uh, to autism. And it's not where, you know, as opposed to the rating scales, where you know the parent um, or and a teacher are completing a rating scale, you know about their observation of the student, um, and the school psychologist will compare those scales for the um, the ASRS, the Autism Rating Scale. The ADOS is an actual test administered by the school psychologist with the student um, that is suspected of having autism, or just they're determining if they do. Uh, meet the eligibility, and there are um, very specific activities that that student is going to go through um, where the psychologist is trained to determine if this meets the uh, criteria of um, manifesting in some sort of autism spectrum disorder. It's a very different way to test and evaluate for autism, and so that's why this piece is really important, having the right personnel doing the testing. Um, because you don't want someone who doesn't know what they're doing determining whether uh, a student qualifies for services or not. 
also important. Um, assessments must be comprehensive enough so that they consider all known and unknown areas of disability. Well, how can you consider unknown areas of disability, Dr. Savage? Well, that's the point. That means you're going to do a comprehensive assessment because you don't know what disabilities this student has, whether it be learning and academic or socially, behaviorally, or you know, kind of emotional uh, differences. So you need to look at all areas that are available to test the student in. That's where the comprehensive part comes in because we just don't know what we don't know when it comes to what is an Im what's impacting a student's ability to access educational benefit. This is built into the law. And so going back to that assessment plan that I said, they're gonna outline what areas they're going to assess in. It should be, if it's the first time they're being assessed, every box should be checked ideally, because they're looking at everything, with the exception maybe if there um, are no speech and language issues, you know, there, there's no articulation or their mobility is fine, they may not need, uh, you know, um, an occupational therapist or, uh, um, you know, those kinds of assessors, related services folks, they, they may not need those assessments. But academically, um, it should be comprehensive enough to, to find any potential uh, disability because many disabilities mirror others like autism, ADD, ADHD, um, even emotional disturbance, um, other health impairment, those kind of dyslexia, they mirror um, or have a lot of the uh, similar manifestations in behavior um, across those disabilities. So you really don't know which one it is if you don't do a comprehensive assessment, okay? So that's my soapbox for assessments. It's so important. And I'll get off of it now because we're at 11.30. So before I go, actually, any questions about? This? Yeah, there was a question from Jennifer. Who typically does the assessment? It depends on which one, but great question. So if we're talking about the, uh, you know, kind of cognitive assessments, um, they're called psychoeducational assessments. A trained and licensed school psychologist should be doing that assessment, okay? If you're talking about a speech and language uh, assessment, if, you know, uh, articulation issues or, you know, communication or uh, uh, memory retrieval uh, kind of assessments, um, that should be a speech language pathologist who is also licensed. Um, kind of mobility issues, you know, or, or, or motor skills, fine motor, like a student having issue holding a pencil or cutting with scissors for very young students, or even um, gross motor skills in PE. Um, that could be an occupational therapist. And, you know, if we're talking about physical uh, mobility, um, an adaptive PE teacher or a physical therapist. Um, academically, uh, you know, looking at, oh, is the student on grade level, you know, with other students. Um, a portion of that cycle ed assessment is going to be done by a special education teacher who um, is knowledgeable about the appropriate academic milestones um, in students similar to the age and grade uh, level of the student, whoever is being assessed. And so there will always be a portion from the teacher, the academic, um, and that's usually going to be the Woodcock Johnson uh, test, and then the psychoeducational assessment from the uh, licensed school psychologist, and then other appropriate related services uh, personnel. Um, so, if, for instance, if uh, you are considering assistive technology, or this is an initial assessment and a student isn't uh, speaking, right, or uh, verbally communicating, we see that a lot in younger students you know, maybe transition from the regional center. Um, there are three, four, five, um, you know, uh, an assistive technology uh, specialist can be a part of the assessment in concert with the speech pathologist because they're going to determine would this student benefit from using some form of assistive technology to help them access educational benefit. They have all kinds of speech generating devices um, that are built into, uh, you know, uh, laptops or um, even like a handheld speech generating devices, talkers, you name it. They, they really have so many resources available to students. Um, and so assessment, 
an assessment plan are very, very important. Okay, if you remember anything from this long training, assessments and assessment plans kick off everything. Other questions? Any others? Sue, is, is that the only one in the chat? Uh, let's see, we had a question about um, AB3632 therapy. And can you get um, occupational therapy rather than traditional therapy in an IEP? Okay. Is that let too me, specific? <laughs> let me, yeah, it's very specific. Let me look at this question uh, in writing. So oh, no, it got sent to question. me directly. You... So. Sorry, that was my question. I guess Wendy, um, tell me more. <laughs> I, I was wondering in general, I've had kids, I'm a dependency lawyer. I've had okay. kids get um, therapy through their IEP by, I think it's AB 3632. And um, sorry, this is kind of a long question. I just went to another training like this week where a psychologist said she really thinks, especially for younger kids, that therapy, traditional therapy is kind of worthless because it's really just about directing um, kids, you, they, they send kids to therapy for certain behaviors that mm. aren't working out, right? They're in school or at home and that, that ther traditional therapy doesn't work with that. And that OT, well, she didn't say OT, but she, she talked about some things, but I think she was mentioning OT is maybe a better choice for a, a kid when you're trying to work on behaviors. So I was just wondering what is the intersection between getting your kids OT or yeah through the through, through their IEP is that too specific <laughs> well it's specific but it's a little uh complicated and so really the it depends is is the response uh it depends on the type of therapy so you know counseling and therapy um that is focused on emotions like feelings things like that's very different from OT, but it sounds like maybe uh, this psychologist, um, you know, I don't know uh, how much experience this psychologist has, but uh, it sounds like they um, may be implying that in younger students, at least, um, behavior is manifesting, um, you know, in a certain way that can be corrected through occupational therapy. And, you know, they don't necessarily think that it is related to uh, emotional uh, issues. Um, well, I think the thing is, yes, it all com it comes from trauma, but it's the right. way to address the 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 concerning issues for everybody is more of a, a more directing yourself to the behavior and trying to work on that. Got it. Opposed, okay. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. She, she. Yeah, I would disagree <laughs> with this psychologist. And the reason well, I would, I'm, I'm probably not representing it correctly, but that's what I got out of it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you're a dependency attorney, so I trust that you are pretty smart and you could follow along what this person was saying. Uh, and so I would agree. Uh, I would disagree um, because although trauma does manifest in many different ways. And, and depending on how old the student is, that could be anything, right? It could be externalizing behaviors where they're aggressive and they're acting out towards others. And it could be very in internalizing, right? Where they are shutting down, um, you know, more severe behaviors, um, you know, internalizing behaviors could be like cutting or, you know, self-harm, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. But what I would say is um, trauma should always be addressed. Um, through uh, therapy and counseling, if possible, um, even in young students, um, you know, redirecting, uh, you know, uh, therapy in another form um, because it's inconvenient or you think they're too young, I think is um, the wrong idea. And it sounds like the psychologist is not necessarily uh, trauma informed, <laughs> uh, does not have a good sense of trauma informed care. And so, we can separate trauma-informed therapy and occupational therapy that is really focused on like motor skills and like, you know, mobility issues uh, to a degree. Those are very different things. 
And so if a student is having issues around motor, uh, their motor skills and motor development, yes, they should be looked at um, you know, and assessed for occupational therapy. But that does not mean that they should not have their uh, trauma addressed or their emotional and mental health addressed. Both can happen simultaneously. It's not an either or um, under special education law. So that, that would be my response, Wendy. And, and we can talk later in office hours at another point if you have uh, very specific, uh, more specific questions and we can think through and see what the Thank you. Talking about. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Let me see here. Okay. So the assessment's been done. The 60 days is up and you are now in a meeting. <laughs> to review the results of that assessment. And this is your first um, or initial IEP team meeting. Um, a couple of things. The IEP team legally must include a special education teacher, an appropriate special education teacher, trained, meaning at the right grade level. Um, now, special education teacher are not gonna be, it's not a second grade special education teacher and their only credential is second grade. It's usually going to be elementary, you know, like middle school, high school, or secondary, elementary and secondary. Um, and they, uh, California distinguish it, distinguishes them by kind of um, uh, mod severe. So the more severe disabilities, uh, a special education teacher who can um, be the primary teacher and say a separated special education classroom with special education students and they are directing instruction for those students. Typically mod severe um, said teachers uh, can do that. Or a resource specialist, we see those as the special education teachers who they may have their own classroom and they do, you know, specific instruction maybe around reading or math for a smaller group of students and they're the case manager. They may push into the classroom. They're still a credential teacher but they're not credentialed for the more moderate or severe disabilities. They're more on the mild side. Um, think more inclusion teachers um, is kind of where they are credentialed at. And so whichever one is most appropriate for the student need, right? So if you have a more mod severe student, a mod severe teacher should be at the table because they can speak to grade level and age appropriate uh, milestones uh, academically. Um, so a, a SPED teacher, a general education teacher, because they're going to give knowledge about typically developing milestones in their students' peers. An administrator with decision-making power um, who can speak to or approve services at that school site. Um, and of course, the educational rights holder, um, whomever that is, um, and the educational rights holder can invite to support them at the meeting, whomever they wish. If they are bringing an attorney, a special education attorney specifically, meaning someone who is, uh, you know, focused primarily on uh, special education advocacy, you know, in their practice as an attorney. They must give, uh, you must give 24 hour notice minimum to the district um, so that they know we have an attorney in a room, they may want to send a, a higher level um, administrator uh, representing the district from the district office just to be in the room uh, for their eyes and ears. If you wish to record, which you have the right to as an educational rights holder, when I say record, audio record, not, not video record, but audio record the meeting, you also must give 24 hour notice. The district will probably also record. Um, and definitely, please leave plenty of time for this meeting. The initial meeting, is typically the longest, and I would say the triennial. Every time you're reviewing assessments, that's going to be a longer meeting. Sometimes annual meetings so long, um, but at minimum, please reserve two hours in your schedule for this meeting only. And that's if there's not a lot of questions. <laughs> um, try to come prepared with your notes and documents of what um, you have observed in your students, the strengths, and areas of need. So you also come with your notes and any documents supporting um, any requests that you're making. 
and that can include medical documents, you know, diagnoses, et cetera. Um, also, you're going to expect to uh, hear about what the district is saying the student qualifies uh, for the services or recommendation of placement um, and their eligibility, right? This is the FAPE, free and appropriate public education offer from the district, placement and services um, that covers. And there's a very specific area in the document that says FAPE. And there they will list any accommodations that they're recommending, like extra time on tests or, you know, extra two days to turn in homework, or they have, student has a right to go back and redo a test at least one time to get a better grade, whatever it is, um, as well as speech therapy services or specialized academic instruction, SAI. That's just a fancy word, a uh, fancy term that they use to say services from a special education teacher. And so sometimes that is uh, extra or individualized one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, pulled out, you know, with that special education teacher. I just mentioned a resource teacher. Um, so, you know, most of the day the student is in general education, but, you know, maybe an hour a day they're pulled out to work with a special education teacher on reading or math or something like that. That would be SAI. SAI also covers when a student is in a special day class all day. It'll just be a higher number of minutes in the IEP, because that's how they break it down. Any questions so far? Okay, keep going. So this is, a, there's a lot of words on this, uh, on this slide, um, but essentially, this is the breakdown of what you will see in the IEP document. The now legally binding document that an ed rights holder has to sign an agreement to to then be implemented for services for the student. Demographic background. Anything about the student, age, grade, how they qualify so that whatever special education eligibility that they qualify for services, when they entered into special education, um, who they live with, you know, it's gonna list the ed rights holder on this first page of the document, um, those kinds of things. Further into the document, you're gonna talk about present levels of the student. How are they performing academically currently, right now, as of the date of the meeting? You're gonna talk about annual goals, the proposed goals um, that the team, staff members, and the specialists are suggesting the student needs to work on because they're areas of need or areas that the student is delayed in. Um, according to the assessment, right, or present levels in the classroom. What does this student um, need extra help on or extra attention? And so these can be academic goals, they can be behavioral goals, speech language, occupational therapy, uh, adaptive PE, social skills, you name it. Um, you can have a goal. Uh, executive functioning um, can be a goal. They're going to, uh, there's a specific page um, that, uh, well, specific section that lists the goals. And then um, in that section, it will tell who's responsible for providing the service or monitoring the goal. It's gonna tell you where the service is going to be uh, received by the student in the general education classroom in the speech uh, pathology room, you know, on the playground with the adaptive PE teacher, wherever it's gonna happen. It's also gonna tell you who's working with the student and who's responsible for the goal, okay? And that's important because I've seen goals where it's like um, a, a speech and language communication goal and, you know, the goal is, oh, student will, you know, initiate, um, you know, asking for help in the classroom uh, when, you know, they are off track and, and they list the student as the person responsible. Well, I'm sorry, the student is not a professional. That should be the teacher and the speech language pathologist because the student is not responsible for these kinds of things. They can support it, but they should not be the only person responsible for the goal, right? So it should be an adult um, or a staff person monitoring that. And how much time or of the service is the student going to receive? Because that's really important. If you have a student, for example, that is transitioning from the regional center 
um, their three, and they were receiving two and a half uh, hours of speech therapy per week, so 30 minutes a day, for instance, because they have severe speech and language delay. And the district in this initial IEP is now recommending 30 minutes or an hour per week. Well, why the change? That's a significant drop. And the student hasn't gained any more, you know, verbal communication. So why are they all of a sudden, you know, dropping and recommending that? There should be a justification for everything they're recommending, including how much time of a service that they are saying is appropriate uh, for the student. Because remember, it's a free and appropriate public education, meaning it meets the needs of the student um, to get educational benefits. We've talked about placement and services. Um, so this is outlined in the IEP, but I wanted to uh, just kind of go over um, the different options. So in terms of placement, um, we, there is what we call a continuum of placement as well as a continuum of services. And so the continuum essentially means um, what are the different options of placement that are available to meet the, new, meet the needs of the student in an academic setting. And so some of these are on the screen. General education, right? With some modifications or accommodations like technology or pull out for speech therapy, that's a related service, right? Uh, a resource specialist that I mentioned, that credential special education teacher, maybe um, the student is gonna be pulled out uh, into that special education teacher's classroom for uh, specific one-on-one -on -one, uh, assistance. A separate special day class, a special education classroom that is designed specifically to meet the needs of more severe uh, or moderate students. A non-public school, that's a separate school um, where the only way you can get to a non-public school is a re direct referral from the school district because they don't have a placement a special education classroom uh, in their district or within the local area, special education local area plan um, that meets the needs of the student. So they have to send the student to a non-public school for more intensive instruction or uh, support. Counseling and rich programs um, also are available for students who meet uh, special education uh, eligibility because of mental health issues or particularly under the eligibility of emotional disturbance. That's one of the 13 eligibilities. And so the, there's a higher criteria to meet, uh, um, to meet the eligibility for a seat, um, the Counseling and Rich Educational Program. Um, th that's some example. Again, the student must be placed in their least restrictive environment. Whatever environment is best for that student to receive educational benefit um, to the grade level curriculum that they can access. Some options of services, uh, think about related services, that's the term. These include speech therapy, occupational therapy, individual counseling um, for emotional and mental health. Um, it could also include uh, behavioral uh, counseling and therapy. Social skills group, we see that more on the, for the younger kids, elementary, uh, but sometimes they have them at the high school level. It just depends on how many students are at that school site that warrant that kind of a group, uh, particularly uh, for the older school, uh, older kids. Um, physical therapy, uh, adaptive PE, I've mentioned, a one-to-one -one aid. Some students can't attend school and receive educational benefit without the help of an adult um, kind of by their side throughout the school day or partially through the day, um, you know, and this uh, is a benefit, particularly when you have a student, say, who is wiggly or has some attention issues, there are some behavioral issues, but they can do the grade level curriculum. And so being in a general education classroom is appropriate so that they can receive that instruction, but they need an adult to kind of keep them on task, right? You don't want to send them to a special education classroom where the instruction is modified because that's doing them a disservice and they won't be challenged and they are entitled to be challenged academically under special education law. Um, and then as you get older, uh, as students get older, you know, career coaching and thinking about transitional age. 
services, you know, um, as they exit high school or the public school setting, what, uh, you know, is appropriate. Now, it says use your imagination as the last bullet here. Now, don't go overboard here. It doesn't mean that they can get the pie in the sky. Um, there's no unlimited amount of services offered through the IEP. Uh, but it does mean that, you know, you can be creative um, in thinking and asking what is available because there, there's a wide range of things that are available. And, you know, if you don't ask, you won't know. And it resources vary from school site to school site and district to district, unfortunately, because that's how education is funded. So I want to highlight ERMS, Educationally Related Mental Health Services, because foster youth are dealing with a lot of trauma and they navigate a lot of things. And what may come up for foster youth is, uh, you know, a need for counseling and to work through their trauma um, and just kind of what they're navigating. They may not associate it with trauma, but the adults in the room and the professionals should know that they need some sort of trauma-informed care. And so ERM is a service um, that is available to students. Um, and they're gonna go undergo a separate evaluation. So in that initial assessment, say, I think the student should be assessed for ERM services counseling. And I, you need to specifically request that. I mean, you shouldn't have to, but I would specifically request it so it is clear that this is the service that you are um, asking for consideration. Um, and so this too will be uh, outlined and designated in their IEP document. Um, and it could include individual therapy or some sort of off-site therapy with a contracted uh, provider. And so in school settings, uh, particularly currently, a lot of districts contract with county uh, behavioral uh, services. Um, through uh, Medi-Cal providers and, and whatnot. And I have a whole soapbox about Medi-Cal. Um, I'm going to keep going, though, because your case supervisor knows my soap, uh, soapbox about it, and they can tell you. Um, and so, again, districts are responsible for providing this therapy as well. It's uh, part of the special education services for each of students. Let's say you've gone through that long IEP meeting, you've reviewed the assessment, you have uh, some goals that you are confident in, um, you agree to the services and the placement um, that they are recommending to serve your student. If you agree uh, to the contents of the IEP, you have a right to sign. You must sign an agreement for anything to commence. Right, and you can sign for the entire document or partially, meaning let's say you agree to the services, speech therapy, special, uh, specialized academic instruction um, and the accommodations, but you don't agree to the placement. You can agree and sign for what you say, yes, I want this to get started, but I don't agree to separating and moving my child uh, out of general education over to a special education classroom because I think they can be just fine in the general education classroom with the appropriate services. You have that right um, and the district will re respond. The second bullet on here, like I said, you wanna have a record of everything. Please make sure that in the IEP document, at the back of the uh, IEP, there's a section called meeting notes. This is a record of what was discussed during the IEP meeting. Please go through that with a fine tooth comb to make sure it uh, reflects everything that was discussed, particularly what you discussed and you said your concerns were what you wish and requested during the meeting. And the reason this is important uh, to do during the meeting or before you sign, right, because you can take the document and I ask absolutely recommend not signing at the end of the meeting because you want to take the document in its entirety. And I think it was uh, Daniel who still hasn't gotten the documents that he's waiting for. You want to review the documents in their entirety to make sure they represent everything that was agreed to and discussed. And there's justification for recommendations of services or you have that assessment uh, the assessment of results. 
right? So that you can review and make sure they're correct before you sign. Just like you wouldn't sign, you know, a new contract that's going to cost you thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Don't sign, uh, you know, don't put your signature on this IEP unless you fully agree and have reviewed the full contract. Okay. If you don't agree, I talked about your right to due process, compliance complaints, seeking out a mediator. That's all built into special education law. Um, and so you have a right to your procedural safeguard. Every school district will give you a copy of your procedural safeguard at the beginning of the meeting. They should. And if they don't, request it. Where are my procedural safeguards? They're required by law to give you one at least once per year. If this is the initial meeting, they should be giving it to you at that meeting. And you can read there the process and it outlines, they're required to, to out, uh, outline how you follow up in their district and with the state in general, okay? These are just some additional notes of how to ask for help, but um, you are all competent individuals. Um, so you know, uh, because I've embedded it throughout the training of what to do, make sure you know who to go to um, and follow up with questions and concerns. Put everything in writing, please, please, please. Um, put it in writing um, and make sure that you um, are clear on everything that the staff is indicating or saying um, that you're agreeing to. We already discussed this um, to some degree. Any questions? You got one minute. I'll stay on after if you will. So thank you. That was a lot of information. Any questions that I can answer that will help everybody in the training. If it's more specific, please make an appointment with me during office hours or at another time if you can't make office hours time. Just unmute yourself if you have a question. Uh, this is Mark Rowe. I have no questions. I just want to say thank you. This, this was great training. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for leading this. This was great. Appreciate Hi, it. Hello. Any questions? Okay. Um, so I hope you enjoy your Saturday. I will follow up with Sue to give a copy of these slides. And um, I think she'll uh, attach the, um, uh, the resource packet um, that I put together. And I will send her the link also uh, to access um, Compliance complaint, uh, the due process, uh, in case you um, are disgruntled or have a disagreement uh, with services thus far. And so, Daniel, you may want to pay close attention to that link um, when there's a disagreement because you may be at that point. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you thanks, so much. Thanks, Dr. Savage. Thank you Saturday so much. Morning. We appreciate you. And thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon.